Marks, it's a real pleasure to be here at Utah Valley University and also to share the, the, uh, the dais with Sam and Chris and to hear about their exciting new work on the Federalism Index. So looking forward to more on that uh, in the future. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, kind of take us back in time and in history to figure out how the Constitution gave us this uh, rather unique thing called federalism in the first place. Um, and also to kind of lay to rest, I hope, some myths about federalism and states' rights. Um, so, you know, just, you know, we, we, we have a declaration of independence from Great Britain. We're fighting a revolutionary war. Uh, it's not going so well. We've got a Continental Congress that's running the war effort by committee. This is always not a very good thing. They continue that operation under the Articles of Confederation, which was a, a treaty alliance of sort of separate sovereign states. Um, without an executive, and uh, the, the experience with the Articles uh, proved that this was not going to succeed. We won the war, barely, uh, but the European powers were still salivating over coming back in and regaining their foothold, um, and the states themselves were engaged in various internecine warfares, trade battles and barriers and what have you. Um, and so they wanted to create a new constitution, following on the lines in the Declaration of Independence that whenever the existing government isn't working out so well in securing our liberties, um, we have the right to alter or abolish it. Um, and the problem was the Articles of Confederation required a unanimous vote to change it. And Rhode Island, with its port and its ability to tax its neighbors without their consent, thought that this was a pretty good deal, and it did not want to allow for any change in the Articles of Confederation. And with the unanimity requirement there, um, they knew that if they just didn't send anybody to the federal convention, you couldn't get a unanimous vote, and they wouldn't have to worry about it being changed. Um, so what they did in the convention in Philadelphia in 1787 was say, wait, wait a minute, that Articles of Confederation was crafted by the states as sovereign. But our political theory says something new. It's not the government that's sovereign, it's the people that are sovereign. The government is just our agent. And so instead of appealing to the government that gave us that Articles of Confederation and with its constraining unanimity requirement, we're going to leapfrog past that to the ultimate higher authority, the ultimate sovereign authority, we the people. And we're going to ask the people directly, rather than through the intermediary of their state governments, to ratify this new constitution. And if you look at the first three words of the constitution, it says we the people, not we the states. It was partly to get around the Rhode Island problem, but partly to tap into this political theory about who the real sovereign was. Now, once we make that break with a couple of millennia of history about the nature of sovereignty and say it's the people rather than the government that is sovereign, the people that can decide how to allocate their exercise of powers of sovereign authority between different governments if they choose. Up until that point, the idea of splitting sovereignty and having two different sovereigns was a contradiction in terms. Here we're not splitting sovereignty, we're elevating it and then passing off certain of the sovereign powers, some to the federal government and some to the state governments. And that is the essence of our constitutional federalism. It's indicated in the first three words, we the people, and then in the notion of enumerated powers that are given to the federal government, which is, I know it's buried deep into the Constitution, Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1. <laughs> the powers herein delegated are vested in a Congress of the United States. That key phrase, herein delegated, means that the sovereign people are giving some of its authority to a national government. And the remainder of its authority is going to remain vested either in the state governments or in the people themselves as they decide to allocate at the state level. Surprising to us today in 21st century America that the federal government was therefore not considered to be the main one. The governments that were going to have the most day-to-day -day interaction with the people and the things of daily life were going to be the state or local governments, not the national government. And if you look into your constitution, at Article 1, Section 8, which is where this list of enumerated powers exists, they are all things that we need to do collectively as a nation rather than the kind of day-to-day -day governing things that each state could decide to do separately and it going its own course. The power to raise money to tax for the common defense and the general welfare. 
the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the states and with the Indian tribes, the power to raise an army and to declare war, to create a uniform rule on bankruptcy, things that if you had different rules would really create a wrench in the system, to create a uniform rule on naturalization, who are going to be allowed to become citizens in this new body politic. All of those things where we really had to speak with one voice, both domestically and on the international stage, those are the powers that are delegated to the national government. Everything else, the so-called police power we heard about earlier today, the power to regulate the daily health and safety and welfare and morals of the people, those were not delegated to the national government. Those were reserved to the states. And this bifurcation of power, things that are truly national or even international to the national government so we can speak with one voice on them, everything else is going to be done much closer to the people at our state governments where we have a greater sway, at our local governments. Things like education and health care, domestic relations, um, uh, intestacy and, and, and inheritance rules, uh, all of those kind of things, local taxation and property taxes, and whether I want wide boulevards with fancy palm trees or, or less expensive regular roads, all of those things are going to be done and decisions made at the local level, more directly, uh, uh, more close to the people, where the people can decide, uh, and there's, a, and there's a, a connection between the benefits to be rise, uh, derived from the taxes to be paid. Now, this, this idea, I think, plays out particularly, and we've lost it in a particularly acute way, in two clauses in the enumeration of powers. And that's the Commerce Clause that we talked about earlier today and also the Spending Clause. The Commerce Clause says that Congress has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the states and with the Indian tribes. That meant that Congress got to regulate the interactions the trade interactions between the states, that if, if we didn't have a superintending body to regulate that, we could end up with little mini civil wars over trade policy breaking out altogether. Uh, but it didn't mean that we regulated the economy. I blame the Chamber of Commerce for this, for screwing up the meaning of the word for us. Chamber of Commerce is the business of America is business. Commerce and business is equated. No, commerce meant the trade or interactions between the states. It did not mean we get the power to regulate the economy if anything we do has an effect on the economy, which would destroy this notion of illuminated and limited powers that it may get to the federal government. So it really did mean things between the states. And you know where at the margins that line begins and where that line ends is going to be sometimes hard to police, but at the margins. Um, in the main, it was pretty easy. If New York's selling widgets to New Jersey, that's interstate commerce. If California is deciding to legalize homegrown medical marijuana for use only within California, that's not interstate commerce. Um, one of my favorite cases that I was involved in was the Arroyo Toad. Um, you know, if we want to protect the habitat of the royal toad, who in the infamous words of John Roberts when he was up at you know, confirmation hearing said, that hapless toad who for reasons of his own decides to live his whole life in Southern California, <laughs> the environmentalist didn't think that was suitable, you know, suitably deferential to the environmental laws. He said, yeah, it's, you know, we can have a federal, uh, a, a federal, uh, uh, endangered species law that protects cross-border species that are articles of trade, but something like the Arroyo Toad that is not an article of trade and that doesn't cross any borders, is sub it should be susceptible to California's law, not federal law. And by the way, I'll use that example just as a, as a perfect example. California has a more stringent endangered species law than the federal government does, but it does not list the Arroyo Toad as an endangered species, you know, the federal government does. Why is that? Well, there are billions of them, and they're not endangered. <laughs> um, California's law actually says it's got to be endangered. The federal law says endangered in all or a portion of its range. And that little last phrase, uh, one of the things about the Arroyo Toad, when the climate uh, change, you get drought seasons and non-drought seasons, the toad sometimes migrates a couple of miles, and they become non-existent in a portion of their prior range. And that was enough of a hook for the federal government to regulate it. Um, and then they declared basically all of Southern California to be a royal toad habitat. And that prevented the California uh, Forestry Services from doing controlled burns to stop um, 
uh, overgrowth uh, of, of dead branches during drought years, and it created some of the worst wildfires we've ever had, all because of this federal overreach. That thing would not have happened if you had keep, kept connected the power to regulate that wholly intrastate thing to the people who were going to suffer the consequences if you got the regulation done poorly. Uh, this is the idea of federalism that's, that's part and parcel of the constitutional structure. So the commerce power was not a broad power to regulate the economy. It was a fairly narrow power to, res to restrict the states from getting in the way of trade among the states. Um, uh, we've narrowed the understanding of the Commerce Clause a little bit in recent years. Famous Supreme Court decision in Lopez in 1995, and then in the portion of the uh, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare case, Chief Justice Roberts said you can't use the Commerce Clause to force people to uh, <coughs> engage in purchasing of health insurance. He then goes off the deep end and says it's a tax and you can use the spending power. So I want to talk about now the other clause and where John Roberts got it so wrong. Because the spending power, which is the other main power in the enumeration of powers most often relied on today, the spending power is equally constrained by this understanding of federalism. And uh, uh, I remember back after the um, 1994 elections when the Republicans took back over the House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years, one of the first things they passed was a resolution that said any bill that goes to the floor of the House has to include a reference to the enumerated power that it relies on. And very quickly they realized if it regulates, it's the commerce power. If it spends, it's the spending power. We don't need to get any more sophisticated than that. Um, you know, and, that and that led to the, the infamous um, statement by, Senator, by, by Representative, now again Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, when somebody challenged the authority to do something. She says, what? Are you serious? We can do whatever we want. So I talked about the limits on the commerce power, but the spending power equally is limited if we properly understand it. And we used to uh, understand it. They did all the way back up into the 1930s, and then we lost the understanding. It says Congress has the power to tax for providing, to provide for the common defense and the general welfare. Both of those are grants of power to spend, but they contain within them their own limitations. It had to be for the common defense, not the local defense. It had to be to provide for the national militia or the national armies, not the local police force the common defense, and the general welfare meant that things in common to the United Colonies as a whole or the United States as a whole, uh, not the local welfare. Um, the, the fight that, that ends up developing between Alexander Hamilton and James Madison on the interpretation of the spending clause, Madison thought that that was just reference to uh, a shorthand for saying the other powers that are enumerated Hamilton says, no, no, it's a standalone power. Whatever limits are in it are contained within the words itself. But even Hamilton conceded that general welfare meant national, not local welfare. That meant if I want to widen the road here in this town, the people that are going to pay for it are going to be the local citizens who will benefit from it. Uh, and they will be the ones to raise the tax and decide whether we want to widen the road or not. It's the local welfare, not the general welfare. A um, uh, story from my hometown in Long Beach, California, they had a bond initiative some years back to try and do just that, to widen one of the local streets to make it a beautiful boulevard and put palm trees in the middle of it and all that. And it was going to be a rather expensive proposition and that people voted it down. And the local officials said, well, that's okay. We'll just go get a federal grant to do for it anyway. And you think about what that means. We didn't think it was worth the money to build it, and we were going to be the beneficiaries of it. But heck, let's let the folks from Rhode Island pay for it instead. I mean, maybe that's good karma, getting back on what they did back in the 1780s. <laughs> but there just seems to be a disconnect uh, between the spending clause and the general welfare. When I get to raise money with national taxes to provide it at the local uh, region, that, that provides a disconnect that is so contrary to the principles underlying our constitutional system of consent to the governed that we can't easily imagine that that's what the founders had in mind. And in fact, for the first 
uh, nearly century of our nation's history, every time Congress decided we're going to spend national money for local projects, um, I mean, you know, it got shot down. It got shot down by the president. Um, it got shot down by the courts uh, if the president was foolish enough to sign it. Uh, this becomes one of, one of the two or three key issues in the election of 1800 uh, was the scope of the spending power. The Jeffersonians win that election in large part because they took a more limited view of the spending power, recognizing the dangers to the federal system, the federalism system, if we had an unlimited spending power at the national level. Uh, uh, Jefferson does that, Madison does that through his whole eight terms, Monroe keeps the lid on it for his whole eight terms, eight years of office, uh, seven and a half years. The last couple of months of his office, he signed an internal improvements bill. It was a little camel's nose under the tent. It was, it was for some clearly national common defense and general welfare projects, but there was one little grant to do a study for some local purpose up in, the ter in, the, in, in, a new, in one of the new states um, coming online. And that just breached it just enough that John Quincy Adams ran a whole truck through it. I mean, he didn't have trucks then, but he ran a whole truck through it. Uh, and it was the reason, uh, in all likelihood, the principal reason that John Quincy Adams was a one-term president, because having unleashed this, this massive spending power, uh, uh, Andrew Jackson used it as the principal cudgel against Adams in the, in the election that, uh, that, uh, that Jackson won. And that stayed the way all the way up through the Civil War. One other aspect I want to focus on on federalism. So the, the, the piece of this, a couple of pieces, sure. It's the people that are sovereign, not the states. So one of the defenses of federalism that kind of crept into our system of government and our public discourse was that the states were, were created the federal government and therefore they can nullify acts of federal legislation as John C. Calhoun um, becomes the defense of, of, of the Southern Confederacy. It's not the states, it's the people um, uh, that are sovereign. The second thing is it's tied to this notion of limited enumerated powers. And if I obliterate those powers, I make the states irrelevant. And then the third piece, the last piece of this, is how do I guarantee that the federal government draws within its lines, uh, stays within its lines? Well, a couple of things. Um, uh, and the most important of them, I think, was structural. Uh, the states had a role in the national legislative process. Um, the states, as states, elected or chose who was going to be the members of the United States Senate. And until we repeal that aspect of the Constitution with the 17th Amendment and turn the senators into just a different version of, of House of Representatives directly elected uh, members of the body, the states are able to keep a lid on expansive claims of federal power because they have a direct representation in one half of the law, lawmaking power of the national government. You take that principal structural check away, and if I were an economist writing at the time, I would have said, you take the check away, the power is probably going to be expanding. And what we see over the century after the 17th Amendment is exactly that. So the famers understood human nature and the attempt to, the, the inclination to want to increase power, to do good. You know, if I think I'm virtuous, the more power I have, the more virtue I can provide. That's kind of a, a fatal flaw in our own human nature. Uh, and they had this structural check on it. One of the reasons we don't think in terms of federalism much anymore is because we lost that structural check. And states have largely become not governing uh, units of their own, but the distribution network for federal largesse. And then the, the last piece on this, and I'll close with this. There was a revival of the idea of federalism a bit in the Reagan administration. It was hard, strongly opposed by the left wing of the political spectrum. And now in the era of Trump, the left wing of the political spectrum is deciding there might be some virtues in federalism. Um, except they're applying it into areas where there is explicit enumerated powers to the federal government, which seems to kind of get it upside down. Questions of war policy, border control, um, uh, uh, you know, immigration policy and naturalization policy, these are clearly enumerated powers given to the federal government, and yet cities like San Francisco think that federalism means they get to decide those issues for themselves. 
They still don't want to decide issues about their local homeless population and all those themselves. They think that ought to be the federal government's business, but they want to, they want to walk onto the stage, international stage, and have their own foreign policy. So I think it's important for us all to both understand the reason we have federalism and to get it right as we go forward and try and reinvigorate a true notion of federalism. Because at the end of the day, the founders all thought that this unique contribution to political science, that we would be great, we would have greater liberty with more government, two different layers of government, each to serve as a check on each other so that liberty could be allowed to flourish, and that the kind of things that we would deal with government on would be most closely to the people where that was necessary, and only the things that had to be done collectively on the international stage or otherwise would be handed off to a far remote government from us. And that would keep both levels of government more in check so that we could be more free. That's the goal of federalism, and boy, it's high time we get it revived. Thanks so much.